this may be the only church meeting where everybody gets here a little early. <laughs> but you're all here a little early. This is great. <laughs> Um, I've been going to conferences as a professor for a long, long time. And there's one thing that always kind of bothers me about conferences, and that is we never get to process what we learned in the last session. So I actually want to devote a little time right now to having you think about, because that opening we just had, was better than any national conference opening, any national keynote that you could go to, whether it's the American Educational Research Association or Association for uh, Educators, anywhere. <clears throat> that was an outstanding statement about what this conference is about and who we are as LDS educators. So, would you just take a few minutes and talk with the person next to you about something you learned, something you want to take away with you, from Brad's talk that we just had. Did you do that? <laughs>
hope you all shared some. Well, I made this mic on. I want to hear if someone came to you right now and said, why are you going to that conference? So tell me in two to three words, I want to just hear a couple of words. Why did you come here? I want to know some of your motives, basically. Shoot them out. Yeah? I've got an email. <laughs> <laughs> you mean every time you get an email, you go to a <laughs> I've been an educator all my life, and uh, I was meant to be a teacher, and I have been a teacher that is terrific yeah look at the power of email <laughs> okay i don't think this works either is this one yeah. yeah. is this working yeah. Yeah. that's okay we deal with what we deal with okay anybody else well you yeah well I was talking to LeGrand Richards here since I'm sitting by <laughs> By the way, my, my college institute teacher was David Whitmer, too. So. <laughs> um, my constant, it's my 30, I'm going into my 31st year, but my constant. Of teaching? Yes. In the public oh, schools or? Public schools okay. in California. Okay. Yes. And my constant um, desire to put spirituality into my children's life, you know, within my parameters, but especially now because the children have changed right. and the world has changed. <clears throat> so many of our basic values have changed that I want them to be successful and happy and Thank you. change the world, you know, all that stuff right. that we want to do. Right. My wife was a sixth grade teacher and so I got a running account, sometimes <clears throat> late at night, like 11 o'clock at night, she'd say, I think there's a mistake in this algebra book <laughs> on the answer key. And I said, I can't think about algebra at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> she said, look at this, this is the commutative law thing, and I think there's a mistake here. And anyway, we'd work out all kinds of things, but she'd come home and tell me about her kids at school. One time we were at a basketball game up in the, whatever it's called now, is it the Vivint Center in Salt Lake? <clears throat> and the jazz place anyway. And we were watching this college basketball game, sitting down here in this seat. This kid comes from the other side of the arena, walks all the way around, you know, to our seat, and uh, during the halftime, and he says, Mrs. Osgathorpe. She said, she called him by name, we'll, we'll say his name was Jaron. Jaron, how are you doing? And he said, I'm, I'm doing so good. He said, he's in junior high at this point. He said, I got all A's last semester, last term. And she said, Jaron, I knew you would do this, terrific. So she was building up. He left and went away <clears throat> and she said, Oh, if you knew the story about him. He had to be taken away from his parents, given to his aunt and uncle to be raised because there was abuse and all kinds of problems going on. And I thought, wow, the effect of a teacher, you know. Um, <clears throat> still have kids come up all the time. Tell, we'll be in Cafe Rio and some. I had you for my sixth grade teacher. <laughs> it's amazing. So, I'm going to talk today. Actually, when Buddy asked me to, to talk, he said, you've been a temple president for three years. Before that, I was in the Sunday school for the church, and so I went all over the place looking at how teaching and learning was happening in the church, or sometimes how teaching and learning was not happening in the church. <laughs> and, I said, you know, I, I could talk about a lot about the temple and what we learned in the temple, but I'm going to kind of take a different tack because we had time, we had a lot of time in the temple. We also had a lot of time outside the temple. Mondays are, the temple's closed. We did not have any sessions on Tuesdays. So we had two full days when we did other things. Well, what kind of came to take our time were refugees in Bismarck. People say, why would refugees? 
come to Bismarck, North Dakota. <laughs> and I said, actually, they came to Bismarck, North Dakota for the same reason everybody came to Bismarck, North, North Dakota for a job. It's a great place for jobs. Lowest unemployment in the nation, oil boom, all kinds of jobs. So <clears throat> we had refugees there. And I think I learned more about learning and teaching, working with those refugees than I ever had before. So we're going to kind of look at this for a minute from, there, from the standpoint of what I've learned about that. Now, I'm saying agency is the power to act as God wants us to act. And I really like Joseph Building McConkie's definition. He says, many suppose agency would be the God-given right to choose between good and evil. Were this the case, it could be argued that God gave us the right to do evil. This simply is not so. What Joseph was trying to teach us, and what other prophets have tried to teach us is, Agency is the power we have from God to do good, to do right, to do what God would have us do. <clears throat> when we don't do that, then we're kind of denying our agency, leaving our agency aside, leaving the power that God gave us and choosing something else, which the Lord does not want us to do. So I, I really like this take on agency, particularly for educators, because I say in education, the greater our capacity to exercise our agency, the more we become like God. And what is learning? Learning is becoming like God. All kinds of learning, doesn't matter what we're learning, if we're learning what we ought to be learning, we are getting closer to God, we're becoming more like Him, and that is unique to our doctrine. It is not doctrine that is taught outside of our church. People don't become like God in other religions. They may think this is somewhat blasphemous. But in our religion, we understand that becoming like Him is why we came to earth. And how to do that it is by increasing our agency. If you have, you know, sometimes you have this image of the old one room schoolhouse in America in the 19th century with the teacher, with the ruler coming up and saying, Spell that word. They don't spell it correctly, and they whap them on it rest right have this these images have some veracity to them and there was a there was a rigidity at that time in education the teacher's job was to make sure to kind of force in a sense this learning to happen but that's not what we understand as LDS educators LDS educators understand that there's no force in heaven there's no compulsion in heaven what we have in learning is to expand our capacity our power to do good, to do right, to choose what God would have us choose. So, this is really the purpose of learning to me. How can we increase our capacity to exercise our agency? Every time we look at a child or a learner, could be an adult learner, it's like, how can I increase his power, her power, to choose the right, to do what God would have them do? Now obviously if we're teaching um, physics, we want them to be able to choose right answers, that's right. We want them to learn the correct content, that's right. But the more we help them choose that to actually act and not be acted upon. You know, you, if you read uh, Elder Bednar um, over the last several years, you will see multiple times when he's talked about how we need to learn to act and not be acted upon. I think he's the only one, at least in my reading, who has talked about the power of a teacher to act upon people in a negative way, right? right? He's, he's saying a teacher can actually act upon somebody in a way that is forcing them to do something that actually God would not have them do, and not increase their agency, not increase their power to choose good, uh, because the teacher knows what's right and knows how that students needs to do it and is going to tell them to do it right now. We used to change people from left-handed to right-handed. Say, so you're not going to be able to be a left-hander. You're going to have to be a right-hander. And right, we have all these patterns that we've had to look at in education and say, wait a minute, how are we expanding the power of agency instead of curtailing it and turning it off? So this is a question I want to ask myself all the time. 
when I'm helping somebody learn? Am I expanding their agency, their power to choose, or am I shrinking it in some way? One educator that I have a lot of respect for, he said, advice can be an act of violence. Think about this for just a moment. Somebody says, uh, that guy gave me some advice, that person gave me some advice, and it, it's really kind of taken me down this wrong turn. And what he's really saying is when advice is not sought after, when the learner is not seeking it, and somebody says, I'll tell you what to do, I'll tell you this is what you need to do, and you need to do it this way at this time, and, and you say, uh oh, this can, you're, kind of, you're kind of attacking this person. This kind of advice is not what the Lord would have us do as LES educators. So this kind of whole thing is you th keep thinking about it throughout our little time together. How do I expand the capacity for learners to choose the right? Now there's various aspects of learning. So we've got motives, we've got content, we've got method, and we've got, now this was last one. Um, we don't usually talk about this very much, this relationship thing, but I, I kind of want to hit this pretty hard today because you look at the relationship my wife had with that learner that walked all the way around that basketball arena to say hello to her and to tell her that he was doing well. This is a relationship. He's not reporting to her his grades. He's not saying I, I need to go you know, give a report to my teacher or anything. He knows that she cared for him. That's why he walked all the way around that arena. It's this relationship that forms between a learner and a teacher that has so much import. But so do these other things. We always are dealing with content. We always have to choose methods about how we're going to teach it. And motives, let's talk about motive for just a minute. This is one of the refugees I worked with. His name is Freddie. He came to me and he said, uh, I lost my driver's license because I had an accident in Pennsylvania before I moved to North Dakota. And, and when you heard about the accident, it was, it, was, it was not his fault. I mean, it was really an amazing thing. This, he shouldn't have had his license taken away, but he did. And so he had to get his license back. And he had to go through uh, the testing process, driving tests and everything again. And so he said, would you help me learn to drive? I said, sure, I'll have to learn to drive. We'll just go out there and drive. I thought this would be not a difficult, super difficult task. I taught my kids how to drive. My kids grew up with cars. He grew up, he said, I didn't grow up with cars. I grew up with cows. <laughs> he said, I never saw a car. And he was, <clears throat> I can't even think about it. He, he was run out of uh, DR Congo because he was of the wrong tribe. He's a member of the Tutsi tribe. The Tutsi tribe is the discriminated against tribe. So he was run out of the DR Congo and went to Burundi. Burundi is a place where the president of the country, another refugee told me, the president of the country stood up one day speaking to the whole nation and said, if you see a Tutsi, it is perfectly all right to kill him. He said, that's the president of our country. And he actually worked in government for that, another one, not for anyone. And then he was run out of Burundi and went to Kenya. And then from Kenya, he finally got refugee status and came to the US. Never seen a car, never seen machines before, really. Never been around machines, never been around electricity. <coughs> Lived in a tent for 20 years. Um, <coughs> So it was actually more challenging than I thought. I was teaching his wife how to drive, which was even more challenging. She did not go to school, so she really didn't know French. He knew French, so I could speak to him in French. Um, she did not know French because she didn't go to school uh, like so many African women. And so uh, her name was Angel. I'd say, Angel, we're coming to an intersection. I say, now uh, turn right. And she said, OK. And she goes, I said, Angel, that's left. <laughs> We're going to die. <laughs> and 
So we had to, one day I got her out of the car and I said, I want you to look at the wheel. She didn't have the feeling of the steering wheel connecting to the wheels. She didn't have the idea that she was controlling those tires in the front of the car that turned like this. So I got her out of the car and I said, look at those wheels. You stand out there and now watch me turn this steering wheel. She goes, oh, amazing. I mean, she was just shocked. She had no idea what she was doing because she'd never been around a car. And so anyway, we taught Freddie how to drive. When he got this license, I was, he looked happy, I was happier because he had to take the written test three times. One time he missed one item too many. I went up to the woman at the desk and said, he's from Africa, he's the second language speaker. Could you give him the benefit of one item? She said, I'm sorry, no we can't. <laughs> I said, okay, we'll do this again. <laughs> you know? So we come back, he takes it finally the third time he passes the written test. He goes to take the driving test and he fails the driving test, and he fails the driving test again a third time, and we worked and worked on it, you know. And he said, and the woman who was driving with him came in and she said, uh, he needs a little work on this and that, but um, he passed. I told my wife, I said, I wanted to throw my arms around this <laughs> driving person and say thank you. He got his license. So he got his license because without his license, he could not work. So he wanted a license so that he could really, it was a motive of love because really, love needs to be our only motive. If we're always doing things out of love, then things are going to go well and we're going to become closer to God. Everything we do needs to be out of love. And this was certainly out of love for him. He loved his family. They had one little child at the beginning, then they had another one, then they had three. They have, now they've got three. It was like they're one year apart. And they both joined the church. Wonderful story, conversion. But he loved his family. He loved others. And if you could hear Freddie pray, you would know how much he loved God. Uh, he was a devout Christian before he came to the U.S. and then joined our church. But <clears throat> he had a very strong motivation to work and provide for his family. It was palpable. So the greater our capacity to love and be loved, the greater our capacity to exercise our agency. So these two things kind of go together. When we increase our capacity to love, we increase our capacity to act as God wants us to act. If we love God enough, we are going to do what God wants us to do, right? We are going to do what we know is right and what He wants us to do. So, this Christ-like love increases our capacity to act and not be acted upon. So when you read Elder Bednar's comments about acting and not being acted upon, taken from the Book of Mormon, you say this is actually very important. We are all acted upon in some quite negative ways almost every day. Your email was a very positive acting upon, right? That, that, was, that was a nice message and you they were there to use your agency totally. Sometimes we get things in email that automatically go to junk or whatever. We've got advertisers breathing down our necks sometimes, right? Robocalls. Uh, we have people trying to act on us to spend our money to do all kinds of things. And we have to say, okay, <clears throat> we have got to remember the Book of Mormon injunction. We are, we are to act. We are agents. And God gave us this power to do right and to do good. We cannot succumb to all of these things around us that try to act upon us. So we've got motives. We got here's content. Now, after he got his license to drive, he could drive to Walmart, and then he was pushing carts. So. How many have been to North Dakota? Nobody's ever been to North Dakota. Oh, look at that. Wow. Look at all these people. North Dakotans. <laughs> been there for 20 years. 
Um, so it's a little bit cold in the winter. So at 25 below zero, Freddie was out in the parking lot pushing carts back and forth, you know, getting those carts and pushing them back to the Walmart. That was his job. He was earning eight dollars an hour. That did not quite make it for his family. He knew he needed to do more. So he heard about being a certified nursing assistant, a CNA. He said, can you help me prepare for the exam for CNA? I said, sure. <laughs> I don't know anything about CNA. I know nothing about it, but I can speak English. And that helps. That helps a lot. You know. Here I'm translating these technical terms on the CNA test into French. It's just really challenging. So, um, but his English was gradually getting better. I said, to be a CNA, you're going to have to get your English good because you're going to have to talk to English patients. You've got to get this English going. So we were working on English with him and the CNA test. <coughs> Has anybody ever done this, been certified to be a CNA? Yeah? No. So, um, it's actually quite involved. So there are, there's a practical test. You have to take blood pressure, you have to take pulse, you have to, you know, do all those kind of practical things. <coughs> and then you have to do, of course, this written test, this miserable written test, like the written test for the driver's exam. But this is way more items. This is a lot of items. And so they have all these online programs, many of them are, that are free, to prepare to be a CNA so you can pass this test. So I was doing this constantly. I mean, we, I don't know how many hours we put in, but this would be hundreds of hours that we put in helping him go through these tests, getting the right answers, <clears throat> because we had answer keys. And painstaking, really quite tedious. But this was content that could prepare him for a new profession. And so I was actually quite motivated as a teacher. You know, motive applies to teacher as well as to student. He was motivated because he knew it could get him a better job. And he finally passed the test. He would come over and take my wife's blood pressure. <laughs> it was hilarious. And, uh, <laughs> And he bought this little thing at Walmart to take it manually, you know. And so it took a lot of tries, a lot of practice. But he eventually passed the CNA test and got a job as a CNA. And, and then, bless his heart, he said, I'm enrolling. I'm gonna, I've got this night job as a CNA. In the daytime, I'm going to take classes so that I can eventually become a registered nurse. So this is like... <laughs> It's like when Brad was talking, do Africans value education? Oh yeah. I mean, he knew if he could pass these tests, get through these courses, he could prepare better to provide for his family. So he went from $14, or went from $8 an hour to $14 an hour, or 15 whatever, as a CNA. This was helping immensely. <coughs> so, this, was worried, this worried me when I was teaching, helping him with CNA, because I had to make sure I knew the truth <laughs> about, about these ideas. But I, I like this quote. This was a former vice president of the university that used to say this. But he said, ignorance is our greatest enemy. And I thought about this a lot sometimes. When we don't know something, it might even you know, be not knowing something about how something works in our home. or how just all kinds of things that confront us all the time. Ignorance is our greatest enemy. When we understand things, when we know things, how to do things, oh, we are empowered again. Our agency expands. We can do more. We can choose more because we know more. And Freddie could do that as a CNA. Now he did not just have to push carts. He could actually help people, giving them pills in the middle of the night so that they could stay alive, uh, taking care of aging people. So, the more we know, the less we can be acted upon. If we understand things, then people cannot tell us and say, well, actually, we already know the truth, and I can't be swayed by that. I have to rely on 
my knowledge that I've gained that I really know, and people out here trying to sway us one way or another, you probably get things like that. Well, these calls, these robocalls and everything, and I always tell my wife, I say, these should be illegal because they really are things in the mail that say, uh, this is for, you know, your credit card is something, something, and if you don't call us within the next two days, you're going to be killed. Or, you know, and you say, how can they do this? this is, and so, but they're obviously getting action from some people. Those people are being acted upon in very negative ways. But so the more we know, the more we understand. I feel like saying, you can't tell me something about my credit card. I know everything about my credit card. I know about what's on it, what's not on it. And you can't sway me this way. The more we know, the less we can be acted upon. So truth is constantly important. Now there's a method. <clears throat> one day, we always have to choose how we're going to teach something. So one day we were driving, I was driving with Freddie downtown Bismarck. And as with any kind of practice, anytime we practice things, surprises happen. And the one who's the teacher said, oh, well, I don't know, I hadn't expected that. So we're driving down and we notice there's a car on fire <laughs> in front of us, and there's a police car. And the police car is there, so then, I hadn't planned on teaching him that, that day, but I said, okay, when there's a police car, and now we need to stop, and we don't even, if it's a green light, we don't go through it. We have to, <laughs> you know, this police car is there in the intersection. Uh, we've got to now go into plan B and had to teach him some other things. So, so the method, of course, that I was using to teach him to drive was personal coaching, being right with him. You might call it tutoring or coaching, whatever you like, mentoring. But this was, <clears throat> I had to go with him a lot. We had lots of hours of driving. And I would have to say, a lot, one time I was with Angel when I was teaching her to drive, and she had a hard time keeping the car straight. She would keep turning like this, and the car would blah, blah, blah. Say, Angel, you know what I'm trying to? It's a straight road. Everything in North Dakota is straight. There are no curves, there are no hills. <laughs> and I'd say, let's, let's just keep it straight. And I'd say, you've got to stay within. Ooh, don't get over it. That, you know, getting over to the left. Keep over here, you know. One day she looked at me and she said, do you know what? She says, you're the only one who does not yell at me when I drive. Oh. <laughs> I said, well, I'm never going to yell at you. And she said, I know, but she said, I can't, I can't let these other people help me. Because they yell at me, they get mad, and you know, they lose their patience. Which I can understand. You know? <laughs> One day, I said, Angel, I said, we are going down the street. I said, you're keeping it in the lines. You are going exactly the speed limit. I said, Angel, you are doing good. I even learned how to say in Swahili, Yusuri Sana. I said, that, that is very good in Swahili. And I said, Angel, Yusuri Sana. And she said, Wow. Oh. <laughs> I said, Angel, keep your hands on your feet. <laughs> that is not something we do. Oh, this was an adventure. <laughs> so there is no substitute for being with somebody, practicing. I call it, we want learning that grows. So after Freddie could pass the test for CNA and do the practical, I wanted that learning to keep increasing. I didn't, if you look at learning, if I can go over here right now at, you, at the university, and I can say, have you taken this class? I say, yeah, I took that two years ago, and now I'm a junior, and I say, so, Tell me what has stuck with you in that class, and they can they maybe will go. Uh, well, I don't know. I had to take that for general education. I don't know. <laughs> and this is learning that goes like this: they learn for the test, and then <sighs> they don't use it. They don't need it. They don't think they actually do need it, but they don't use it, and then the learning decreases. Learning scientists have documented this very much. It's called decay. They call it learning decay. You have this rise and then it decays. 
So he says, we don't want that. I don't want Freddie to do well on the test, pass the test, and then have it decay. And so every day he does worse, right? You want that to keep growing and growing as he practices and uses it, right? <clears throat> we want learning that grows. So how to do this? Well, deliberate practice, those of you who have not looked at this concept called deliberate practice, we could talk for all day about each of these things, but this one is exemplified in the book called Talent is Overrated. Have you seen that book? The Talent is Overrated. It's a, nice, it's a nice book. But it only has really one message, and that is if we want to get better at something, it's got to be deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is where it has several components. One is you've got to have somebody who can help you personally, so a coach, tutor, or whatever. And then eventually, this deliberate practice, people become so good, people become <coughs> sort of doing something, they know what they need to do to rise to the next level. They do not spend their practice time in vain. They do not waste practice time. But they're always working on the next thing that will take them to a higher level of performance. And they learn how to do this, and that's why they get so good at things. So great musicians, great um, orators, whatever it is, they, they know what they need to work on, and they were always working on that. They learn from coaches and tutors. So deliberate practice is essential. Freddie and Angel did a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> now, this, this is a phrase I take from uh, the, the New Testament where it talks about good conversation. I really like this because a learning, teaching thing, uh, I mean, I was with Freddie, I was always back and forth with him in good conversation. Um, and that's how learning and teaching ought to occur, not just one way. So I actually, I can't put this on the screen without asking you to just have a good conversation right now about something that you are getting, even right now, that could be helpful to you. Even some new thought you've had, may, may not be anything that I've talked about, but some new thought you've had even in the last few minutes. Just talk to each other for a minute about that. <laughs>
So I was trying to see, you know, maybe I'll try to understand her Spanish. <laughs> I practice Spanish all the time. And um, oh, she was kind of screaming at the person on the other side of the line. And I just walked past, and I walked quite a ways, and went around and went around again, and I came back. So this is like 30 minutes later, I walked past her again, same tone of voice, said, this is not good conversation. <laughs> this is debilitating, miserable conversation. I mean, I don't know what was happening in her life, but she was very angry, and the person on the other end of the line I, maybe was the source of the anger, I, I don't know. And I thought, good conversation, like even the one you just had, you learn something, and you feel uplifted. You feel better about yourself, about life. This is such an important part of learning that grows. Because the conversation needs to continue. We've got friends we get together with sometimes, as you do, we don't have to kind of <clears throat> catch up in a sense with each other. We can just lie into a conversation instantly because we know each other and we love each other. And that conversation is uplifting every time. Counseling together, so we have all this now in the church about teacher councils. When teacher councils were being devised, when we were thinking about this, <clears throat> I went to Elder Ballard one day and I said, we've got state councils, we've got ward councils, we've got family councils in the church. Could we have teacher councils? <laughs> it didn't take him long. I mean, I knew I was talking to someone who liked council or something. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm all for it. He said, I don't know how it will go with the rest of the brethren, but let's, let's pursue this. So, this is how teacher councils kind of happened. And this is, this, this whole, when we counsel together with each other and we help one another, I was in one of these teacher councils and this teacher of 12 year olds, he said, he said, I don't, he said, 12 year olds don't talk. It's made me smile. I thought, actually, 12 year olds do talk. <laughs> he said, I can't get them to say anything. He says, I told the story the other day, and they just, boom. And when I asked them to kind of chime in, they, nothing. It was just like blank. And sitting on the other side of the room was kind of a big circle. It was this sister who said, She said, Let me give you a little secret, a little hint. Don't tell a story about what happened to you yesterday as a 40 year old. Tell a story about what happened to you when you were 12, and they will talk, and they will relate to it. You try it. He said, oh, that's a good idea. The leader of the teacher council afterwards said, I said, that was my favorite moment of that, where that one teacher helped the other one. And he said, that was his wife. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, Elder Holland, or Elder, I'm sorry, Elder Maxwell used this term several times in talks. He said we need more deserved, specific praise. Not just praise that says, oh great, you're just doing great. No, but specific praise. The kind of praise that I gave Angel when I said, you've got it in the middle of the lane. You're going the right speed. You're going straight. This is good, Angel. This is very good. And so, I don't think there's anybody out there that could not stand to receive a little more deserved specific praise. You notice how Brad does this. Brad is phenomenal. You know, he, Rasoski Thorpe, you've done so much good. He's giving praise, basically. He's a praiser. He knows how to praise. He praises Buddy. He praises, you know, all these people because he builds people and he is just who he is. So we can all give more deserved specific praise. Now, this thing about relationships, we, we don't usually talk about this. In fact, I haven't really heard this talked about very much in educational method books or anything. But I think it's like the most important thing. 
Now, I'm coming to believe this, this kind of supersedes everything else, the method, the content, everything else. <clears throat> It's the real, you know, that, that kid that walked around the, that arena to talk to my wife didn't talk to her about the content that he had learned from her in her class. He, he didn't come up and say, wow, the way you taught commutative law was just so great. <laughs> you know, he didn't do that. He was connecting on a different level. He was connecting on a relationship level. This is what we need more of in education. And when we have, as we do sometimes on this campus, one teacher and 500 students out there, this is a little, this is so crazy. We could, we could do much better than this. We can find ways, particularly now with technology, my goodness, we can find ways to connect with each other and have meaningful relationships with students that I think change us. So relationships born of learning can continue to enrich our lives. This came out, uh, you know, in that, I love that poem that Brad had, um, The Answering Machine, <clears throat> because the teacher, it was long ago, that an answering machine was from a teacher the teacher had had long ago, but the teacher kept teaching, you know? We can't, <clears throat> negative relationships do the opposite. They inhibit our growth. And so there can be a negative relationship with a teacher. There can be a negative relationship between two students. As teachers, we have to kind of moderate this. We kind of have to look around and say, what can we do to help relationships get better? If this person is always kind of attacking, well, of course now we talk about it so much in schools about bullying. We can't, we can't tolerate this. This cannot be, this is the ultimate uh, opposite of what we want. And so, We've got to figure out how to focus on relationships and think about them. These positive things nurture our growth, the learning that grows. So mentors keep mentoring. I think often about mentors that I have had and in my life, and I think, boy, you can think of a mentor you've had, right? Can, can you all think of some mentor that you've had that has had an effect on you? Yeah. Just tell the person next to you what effect that mentor has had on you and continues to have now, even now. Just tell them for just a moment. Sometimes you say, I, I can't do this. 
And they said, no, actually, you can't do this, and I'm going to help you get there. Yeah, this is great. This believing you thing reminded me of when I was in the faculty center, we would ask faculty to think of a teacher that was especially effective in their life. One of the most common things that comes out is, it would say, the teacher showed confidence in me that I did not have in myself. I did not have it. The teacher showed this confidence, and that engendered confidence eventually in me that I could do this. It was, it's a, it goes with this, with what you said, and what you said. <clears throat> Great stuff. So mentors keep mentoring, and teachers keep teaching like the answering machine teacher did. This, what, what we're really trying to do is, as a teacher, we're trying to build up each other's soul. <clears throat> I had a, this is a return missionary from the Bismarck, North Dakota mission, the North Dakota Bismarck mission. He was not my missionary when I was president of the, North, of the South Dakota Rapid City mission. Really the same mission, they just changed the headquarters. But he was a missionary when I was temple president. <clears throat> saw him not long ago, and I said, do you ever want to take a hike? So he took a hike with me, and we hiked up the mountain. And I'm coming down, he's 20, I'm 70, one. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> he said, you probably don't remember this, but I was in the temple, and he came up to me, and he said, you noticed I was kind of worried something was wrong, and, and you said, what? What's going on? What's happening? And <clears throat> he said, I told you I, was, I felt very inadequate. I'd just been made a zone leader, and I didn't feel like I could do it. And he said, you probably don't remember, but you, you put your arm around me, and you said, <clears throat> I remember when you were in our home, and you taught that investigator. I don't know that I've ever been more impressed with a missionary than I was with you that day during that lesson. He said, that made me feel like I could do it. You know? So, and I actually did not remember that thing because it, it happened quickly. And, um, but this is what we're trying to do with each other as learners and teachers. We're trying to build up each other's souls give people strength. Peers can do it with each other. Peer tutoring, peer mentoring, whatever we want to call this. But when learners are working with learners and they're helping one another, oh, great things can happen. Sometimes cross-age tutoring can be very powerful where the sixth grader tutors the first grader or the second grader. And the second grader's like, at the first grader's like, wow, you just like, <laughs> the greatest person in the world, you know? And, and they look up to that older student, and learners can be powerful with each other. But we need to help them learn that they're competing with themselves. You know, that's what I liked about the CNA test, and even the driving test. Freddie was not competing on a, on a norm reference thing. He was going to say, well, you did better than 60% of the people so you get your license. No, he had to actually do it. He had to actually show somebody he could drive. And so this is what we want to help students know, is you're competing against yourself. Do not worry about this one over here. That one over there might be doing better than you are. Right? Don't worry about this. You compete with yourself and do better. <clears throat> if any of you do exercise, or all these apps now, that you can see how you're doing. And they report back to you. This one I've got now sends me an email and says, Congratulations, <laughs> you just did this many, you got this many points. I mean, it's kind of funny, and I think, Oh, I want to get some more points. <laughs> okay, so cooperation. This is, goes back to the peer tutor and peer help um, and collaboration. So these learner to learner relationships, 
we are the ones who help foster those. We, as teachers, we help foster those. These are gospel-centered things. You know, we compete against ourselves. We do not compete against others. This is gospel-centered. But, you know, the Lord doesn't grade on a curve. <clears throat> he helps us do what we need to do as individuals. <clears throat> so, and finally, the learner and the teacher, and these are special relationships <clears throat> that we have as teachers and as learners. I always told my kids, I said, you know, I never really became a, a I'm, I'm just a learner. I don't really, I think of myself as a learner. I, I want to just be learning all the time what I need to do to do better. <clears throat> and so the spirit, as we learned in the last session, can help us to do that. We can, with God's help, learn what we need to learn and teach what we need to teach. And that requires faith and back to love again. So my, my witness to you is today that <coughs> when we think about learners and how we can increase their power to choose the right, to choose what God wants them to choose, when we think about helping them acquire truth, when we look at the method that we're using and saying to ourselves, is that empowering this learner or not? And when we then consciously focus on the relationship and say, is my relationship getting better with this student? Is it getting worse? Is it getting better? How can I make this stronger, better? so that we can all end what's my relationship with the Lord as I go about my everyday life. I bear witness that as we do that, he will help us, he will inspire us. As Brad said, he will get the light in. The light just won't go on, but he will get it in. And we will be able to achieve what the Lord sent us here on earth to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So now we are at break. Okay. Yeah, great.